Have you tried training methods that just didn't work? Do you feel that your pet is not getting his or her nutritional needs met? Are illnesses and bad behavior your daily norm? You're going to want to join me on the Pet Parenting Reset, where you'll hear interesting and informative interviews and get solutions to all your pet problems. I'm your host, Jessica L. Fisher. Well, hello, you wonderful pet parent. Thank you for joining me here on the Pet Parenting Reset. I'm so glad you're here with me. We are actually on episode seven of the Pet Parenting Reset. And today we are talking all about setting your dog up for success. I know I have said this so many times throughout content on all of my many social media channels, but I wanted to do like really just talk about what that means. What does it mean to set your dog up for success? Now, if you're watching the video version, uh, thank you. And also you have probably noticed that my setup is a little bit different because I had to commandeer my husband's office today. He was done using it for the day anyway, this is his desk. I did bring my chair in here and I've replaced some of, I took down some of his decor and I did bring in a beautiful picture of Kimberly and you know, just a couple of my things. Um, you can actually kind of see his chair off to the side here. His chair like engulfs me. So if you're watching the video, that's what's going on. Uh, hopefully the next time I get to record, I will be back in my office. Um, nothing's wrong with my office, it's just that we have people working outside and my office is on the very front of the house, so it's loud. And yeah, they've been working for a couple of hours. I don't know when it's gonna stop. Anyway, no worries. <laughs> just to under let you understand if you are watching the video version. Um, if you're not, the videos do go live uh, a week later on YouTube and Rumble. But the podcast, if you are audio people, then the podcast goes live on Spotify. Finally got it up on Apple um, Podcasts is what it's called now, Apple, Apple Podcasts. And I think there are some other places you can get it too. But Spotify and Apple, I think are the two, two big ones. Oh, the Google Play Store, I believe is the other one. It's all there. Anyway, so thank you so much for being here. If at any point during this, uh, podcast. If you like the content, please do make sure to give the podcast a five-star review and follow. I hope you follow. There's so much more to come. So let's get into setting your dog up for success. So one of the first things that we talk about or what we, what we think of when we say set your dog up for success, we are talking about managing the environment for your dog. Now, distractions are inevitable, yes. We're gonna talk a little bit more about actually training uh, a, a little bit later in the podcast, but just let's, let's first start out with managing your dog's environment. Now, before I get too much further into this, I do want to throw in a huge disclaimer uh, because I, I see this all the time, like literally all the time, somebody will post something about getting their dog to stop some behavior, and there will be a hundred plus comments of crate train your dog, crate train your dog, crate train your dog. Listen, I am not opposed to crate train your dog. In fact, I think for at least most dogs, there may be some dogs out there where it may not be appropriate, but at least for most dogs, crate training is a necessity. However, I think we are using it wrong. Um, yeah, there are some people that just throw their dog in the crate constantly, all the time, for hours on end because they don't wanna deal with them. And that is absolutely 100% not appropriate. When we talk about managing our dog's environment, yes, crate training is important, but it's a pretty small part of managing the environment. Now, if there are things in your dog's environment, and this is, I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. If there are things in your dog's environment that you know are just too tempting for your dog, or you just don't even wanna take the chance that they might be too tempting for your dog. For example, does your dog like to chew on shoes, right? Do they like to take and steal your shoes or somebody else's shoes in the family? 
and they find a nice cozy place out of the way to just sit and chew on that shoe. It happens, guess what? Keep your shoes away. If you need to close your closet, keep your shoes in the closet, close the closet door, then that is managing your dog's environment. But I also wanna take it a step further and say, if that is an issue, if your dog likes to chew on shoes, then we need to provide them appropriate chew toys so that they can still get that energy out and they can still get that motion that they're looking for. Maybe maybe they're teething or maybe they have something else going on. They're just or, or wanting to exercise and they need to move their jaw or they're trying to clean their teeth or whatever it may be. Let's provide them a appropriate chew toys and keep those things out of their environment that we don't want them to get to, that we don't want them to have access to. That is so key. So let's talk a little bit more about actually training with your dog and how we manage the environment and how we manage uh, your dog's behavior when we are actually training. So let's say you have a dog that absolutely loves birds. Or really, when we're training anything, when we're going outside, dog, there are like infinite distractions outside, right? So, I mean, there's cats, there's squirrels, there's lizards, there's the smell of nature. There are, there's possibly trash around, there could be feces around, there could be ducks, there could be other people, there could be bikes, cars, skateboards. There are so, I mean, obviously the list just goes on and on and on, and these are all potential distractions for your dog. So when we are outdoors, or especially if we are in a training situation, if we are, even if we're just walking our dog and we're not really looking for a training situation, managing the environment, your best tool is going to be that lead or that leash. It may just seem like something mundane that you have, but that is an invaluable tool for you. So we can give our dogs leeway and we can let them, when we're going out on a walk, we can let them sniff and smell and interact with nature and their environment because that is enriching. That is enrichment for our dog. We don't want to uh, deprive them of that in any way, but we need to be careful and we need to focus on safety and we need to make sure that our dog isn't going to see a bird or a squirrel or a duck or whatever it may be on down the way or a lizard or whatever, you know, a leaf blowing in the wind for some dog, right? And they just bolt and take off. That lead or that leash is your management tool to make sure that while you're giving your dog room to explore and have that enriching experience and take in all of the nature and the wonderful environment outside of your home, we are keeping safety in mind so that your dog can't run and run and run and run towards whatever may be moving in the distance, right? That is another example of a management tool and ways that we set our dogs up for success because if there is something in the distance that your dog wants to get to and they run and you have not worked on your recall, then mm, that could be a bad situation, right? So managing the environment is key. Now I will say I also like to work with dogs with long lines and these are very inexpensive. They are, they're a leash, but they are longer. You can get some 20 feet, maybe 30 feet. These are not necessarily appropriate for everyday walks unless you live far out in the country, but to give your dog room to roam while having that safety in mind that your dog can't get but so far away from you, your dog isn't gonna run off, but so far away from you, right? You're going to be managing their environment. That's another really great way, having that long line in your pocket is another really great way to manage environments even if you have a big open field that you want to allow your dog to explore in, which would be great, right? That's enriching. That's them getting to interact with the environment and smell all the smells and do all the things and take in everything, but keeping safety in mind and managing the environment so that your dog can't run off, but so far. So let's go back to that bird that I brought up just a moment ago, because there is what is called an antecedent and that sounds like a big fancy word and it is but basically it's just anything that triggers a cue or a behavior in your dog for instance 
telling your dog to come, right, when we're training recall, when your dog comes to you on that cue of the word come, that's an antecedent because it's triggering a behavior in our dog. Similarly, if there is a bird and your dog sees it, in this example, your dog absolutely loves birds, but it could be anything, a squirrel, a lizard, um, a, a toy, another dog in the distance, whatever it may be. In this instance, we're just gonna say a bird to keep it simple. Bird for your dog means chase go run and go get this dog, right? That bird is an antecedent because it's a cue that is triggering a behavior to chase it. When we think about that and we think about all of the things going on in our dog, dog's environment that compete with us, right? When we are training our dog or if we are, you know, when we're working on training, let's talk about a recall because that's probably one of the most I don't know, if I could only pick one cue that any dog should know, it would be a recall. It would be the, you know, come when called. So there are so many things competing for your dog's attention in the environment. So when we talk about setting your dog up for success, when we are specifically talking about a training environment, we want to start training with our dog with no distractions. That way we can really get hone in that behavior and we create that association with the antecedent, like I was just saying, which is going to be the word me telling my dog come and the behavior that I want it to trigger, which is coming to me when I say it. So if I say Kim come, which is my dog, then the behavior that I want that to trigger is for my dog to come back to me from wherever she may be. Now, the best way to do that, I mean, you're not gonna start training your dog to come to you in the middle of a park surrounded by dogs and squirrels and birds and trees and all these wonderful things that are competing for your attention, for your dog's attention. That is not the best place to start. So when we talk about setting our dog up for success, we're talking about starting that cue and creating that association with minimal or no distractions. So we want to start working inside of our home. It's the most comfortable place for our dog, the, the place where uh, they have the least distractions because they are used to the environment. Now, over time, as we start to get better at this cue, as our dog starts to get better at this cue, as that association with the word come starts to trigger and continually triggers that behavior of your dog coming when you call them. We can slowly start adding in distractions and we wanna add in minimal distractions at first. So maybe we're adding in another animal that is already part of your household, right? Because even if you have a multi-pet household, training should start with just you and your one dog at a time. That's that's the best way to train, minimal distractions, minimal to no distractions, and then slowly start adding in minimal distractions. Get better at making sure that that cue triggers the behavior you want, continually working on it, right? And then you can start increasing distraction to where you get to the point where you can go outside in your backyard, have your dog, come to you when you call them because that association has been made that that come cue that you have asked for means it triggers that behavior of your dog coming when called so i don't want to get too much more long-winded on this topic but that's really what we are talking about when we mean set our dog up for success and this doesn't stop when we think we have a good behavior right we think we have a good recall or we think we have a good sit or we think we need to continually reinforce this throughout the lifetime of our dog and you know that may, these management tools may need to be in place um, for various reasons and, and potentially for the life of your dog for example i think one that probably needs to be involved in most dogs lives for their entire life is a leash and and potentially a long line if you are in an environment where you can allow your dog more room to explore. 
And that's because one, most people don't work with their dogs enough to where a recall is like on point, spot on, but also there are a lot of environments in which it's just inappropriate for your dog to be off lead um, because there, are, there could be other dogs around who are scared or nervous and well, so many other reasons, right? But that is one management tool that I truly think should be in most dogs' lives for their entire life. Now, that's not to say you can never take your dog off lead or off leash. I think there's a time and a place, and especially if you have worked really long and hard with your dog to make sure that you, your dog is behaving appropriately for the cues you are giving then sure, there could be times where that's a really great re reward for both you and your dog to be able to walk off lead. But again, we have to take into account the entire environment. So only do that when it is absolutely safe for you and your dog to do so. Now, let's go back to the dog like liking to steal and chew on shoes, right? So what is a great way to manage your environment in an instance where let's say you have a shoe rack by the door and that's where you and your family put your shoes but your dog likes to go and steal those shoes what could we do to better manage that environment as i was saying earlier you could put your shoes in the closet and close the closet door that's one way but uh, as I said earlier, in addition to that, you do need to provide your dog with appropriate chew toys to replace those shoes that you have just taken from him. Now, another way you could do this is by, if this is a behavior that your dog has been exhibiting over and over for a period of time, what you could do is take that shoe rack and move it to another location. And in place of that shoe rack, put a basket of appropriate toys for your dog to chew on. Now, your dog has that learned behavior to go to that spot to get his chew toys, right? Now, in that spot, you have moved your shoes away and instead replaced it with appropriate chew toys. This is a really great way to work with your dog, set them up for success, and manage the environment by putting his chew toys in the place where he is already conditioned to go to get his chew toys, which were your shoes, <laughs> and not appropriate chew toys. So we're replacing them with appropriate chew toys. Now, there are instances where you may need to lock up your shoes in a closet for a period of time and replace them again in that place wherever your shoes previously lived, make sure you have some toys available for your dog that are appropriate chew toys. And then over time, as your dog gets better about using those chew toys, interacting with your dog, by the way, is a great way to encourage your dog to use a new toy or a novel item such as a chew toy. And then eventually you may be able to test the water with bringing your shoes back out in a different location, of course, because we are working to, we're working with our dog to manage the environment and set them up for success. So that kind of in a nutshell talks about what I mean when I say set our dogs up for success. I hope you enjoyed today's podcast. If you have any comments or questions, please make sure to reach out. I, def I love hearing from you and I love getting your questions. And who knows, I might actually answer your question on an upcoming podcast. Please make sure to give this podcast a five-star review. If you do enjoy the content, make sure you are following me across all social platforms. It's the Pet Parenting Reset anywhere you go. And yeah, thank you so much for being here with me. Oh, really quickly, if you have not already joined our Patreon family, I really cannot wait to see you over there. There is so much wonderful stuff going on over on Patreon. You can find it by searching the Pet Parenting Reset. Again, as I was saying, you can search the Pet Parenting Reset on all social media platforms. You can also go to the show notes. So if you go to my website, jessicalfisher.com, Fisher is F-I-S-H-E-R, click on podcast. You can get to my, that's my podcast page, and there will be a link for my link tree. My link tree has everything, guys including the link to Patreon. But you can also just go to patreon.com slash Jessica 
Fisher. So I definitely want to see you over on Patreon. I, I joined the family. I don't know why you haven't done it already. There's so much exciting stuff going on over there. New and exclusive content behind the scenes. We talk about lots of stuff that I don't talk about anywhere else. So you definitely want to join the family by joining me over on Patreon. Thank you guys so much for joining me in today's podcast. Again, make sure you are following so you can get notified when the next podcast goes live. And yeah, until then, give your pets some hugs and kisses and love from me. Bye guys. Talk to you next week. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel so you never miss another video.